I get a few minutes with somebody who loves James Baldwin and who's doing something about it, making it available more, and some stuff that uh, isn't always out there uh, being uh, sort of repeatedly used when there is such an incredible amount of extraordinary writing. Uh, and uh, Norman G, you, this is a, this is a, a, um, a, a love in your life, James Baldwin. Can you tell us, get us interested in James Baldwin, uh, why he's important to you and why he's important now? What What's uh, timely about Baldwin? Uh, what's timely about Baldwin? Um, it's been amazing for a few years now to um, see the quotes everywhere and the little video clips everywhere as we approached his 100th birthday. Like, wow, you know, James Baldwin is is what's happening now so even today um so the big news today first thing i heard this morning tyree nichols that case one of these policemen has the second i think policeman has um pleaded guilty and to murdering him to him. Death. so this was yeah yeah, yeah to beating him to death yeah um and when this first hit the media i was I, so i've been working on this project for a couple of years and um I, we've been developing little pieces. We did all this reading and research on James Baldwin. And a couple of years ago, uh, the Tyree Nichols case kind of hit the mainstream press, major media. And I've been asked to, to showcase a little piece of what we were working on. So I brought in this piece about uh, James Baldwin wrote an essay called Journey to Atlanta. It's in his first collection of essays, Notes from a Native Son. And Journey to Atlanta, he talks about his brother David going to Atlanta and seeing the first five Negroes who had been hired for the police force who were not allowed to um, arrest white people. So they were willing, indeed eager, he says, to find any Negro they could, that they could arrest to prove that they were worthy of the job. And this hit the mainstream press just as we were as i was working on this part of development and i went oh my gosh i'm just going to share this and it was such it was so satisfying to see the jolt of electricity go through the audience when i read this stuff because it sounded like it was fresh off the news page i know i noticed uh i love the, the, the sort of the do's and don't do's that Bald, of from baldwin that you've got listed like um if you got to report something to a cop Make sure it's if you're a black person. Make sure it's a white cop, because a black cop is going to kick the hell out of you. A lot worse to make the point. Right, and he knows you. That's the other thing Baldwin says is he knows you better than that white cop ever could. Yeah, so it was just so this all grew out of many years ago. um, Local playwright Richard Talavera approached me about doing a Richard Wright centennial. And I had to admit, I didn't know a lot about Richard Wright, so he told me uh, all kinds of things. He's a communist. He's, he moved to Paris and lived in Paris the last 12 years of his life. He, you know, he dropped out of school, and yet he became this major writer, all this stuff. And I was like, this sounds great. I love it. Let's do it. And then he said, I don't want to write a single word. I said, wait a minute. You're a playwright. What are you saying? So his proposal to me was there were so many writers, not just Richard Wright, but... Ollie Harrington, who was a Negro press cartoonist um, who went all the way up through uh, the first George Bush as a political cartoonist. Um, Chester Himes, who is mostly known for things like Cotton Comes to Harlem. He was a, he wrote this um, series of detective novels set in Harlem, a place he had barely been to. Um, and all of this, and this something he started while he was in Paris he had followed, all these people followed Richard Wright to Paris, and so they all write about their experiences. So we took all of this and sort of mixed it together with some biographers and interviews and, and stuff, and we made a Richard Wright centennial. And that was when I became familiar with James Baldwin, who had a young, as a young man had decided he had to get out of America, followed Richard Wright, and Richard Wright, trying to be magnanimous, um, gets him a job writing for a local magazine. 
and he writes an essay, the first essay he writes, Everybody's Protest Novel, where he talks about how Harriet Beecher Stowe and Uncle Tom's Cabin is not a good novel, it's a protest novel, and then he compares it to Native Son by Richard Wright. So until Richard Wright died, this feud went on, until Richard Wright died, and then after he died, Baldwin finally admitted, maybe I did kind of criticize him, kind of throw him under the bus. Um, but that's when I first became familiar with James Baldwin, and so I, I'd known about him, but then I started to really do a deep read. And, and, and in, th in thinking about those two writers, just as sort of a general framework, um, Richard Wright is, you know, his bigger, for instance, his character bigger, you know, yes. the hunted warrior character, the, the character on the run. Uh, yes. the fearful, the hidden, whereas Baldwin is celebrating, right? He, he's not, right, you know, he's ducking the punches, but he's telling the truth. It sort of reminds me of this yes. film, Tell the Truth and Run, you know? <laughs> yeah, Baldwin, um, Baldwin, Baldwin follows in Richard Wright's footsteps. He's definitely standing on his shoulders, absolutely, but he has another story and the thing is Richard Wright kept saying to writers like people don't know this but Ralph Ellison was in school to become and he was in music conservatory he was a music student and he met Richard Wright at a party and Richard Wright said you should write and he showed Richard Wright the first thing that he wrote and Richard Wright said don't write like me Baldwin <laughs> took that message to heart and he said no, well what is my story and that's what he keeps telling and how does your story, you, uh, hook up with Baldwin in a way that you want to devote so much energy to making him available beautifully uh, here in the Bay Area? Well, I, Baldwin seems to like to make people uncomfortable, and he definitely makes me uncomfortable. Um, a man who was, by all accounts, pretty out, like if you knew James Baldwin, you knew he was gay, and yet at that time it was illegal in so many places to be out um but he's not afraid of that his first novel is autobiographical his second novel is giovanni's room and as we say in our play he makes you fall in love with giovanni and i totally yes it's one of the most romantic things i have ever read the meeting of the main character david and giovanni the bartender in this gay bar um yes. It just makes you fall in love. And I love that Baldwin found a way to do that. Um, what we do is we focus our story of, in the period 1961 to 1971, which in terms of his career is a fairly prolific period. But what people don't know is that he spent much of that time in Istanbul. He went back to Paris for, you know, meeting publishers and seeing friends. He came back to the States. That's when he's writing a lot of his civil rights stuff. But he kept going back to Istanbul. And I was like, what is this about? There's actually a beautiful book, and it's called Baldwin's Turkish Decade. I never saw that. <laughs> and and so I, no, I, I didn't know anything about this. And I was like, so what is this about? So yes, he spends a lot of time there, but what does that mean? And I love that the biographer Magdalena Zborowska um, a Polish woman who was in her women's studies and somehow read a James Baldwin novel and fell in love with him and started going to find out who this man was. And she found out about this decade, and she said, nobody's writing about this, so she wrote about it. There's a way where um, Baldwin becomes, she says, Baldwin was a black writer and a gay writer, but in Istanbul he became a black gay writer. He started to take more of his identity. He felt more comfortable, and it's the culture is so different. Istanbul is not Europe, and it's not Asia, and it's not North Africa, which they are quick to tell you. But there's somehow all of that is going on in this place. And so even the, the homosexual piece, uh, the interviewer, the biographer kept interviewing people to ask, well, what was it like? How did you feel about James's homosexuality? And the Turks were like, you know, that's not really a thing here. We don't, it's normal. It's a part of our culture. We look at it differently. And I think Baldwin got to find a part of himself in a public way that he couldn't anywhere else. 
What was his life like in the Bay Area? What are the significant things that he ha had done or written? Or what was his life like? Well, I think a lot of people will know there's a KQED special, and I love this. This goes back to before there is PBS, before there is a national thing. There were yes. um, regional um, public stations, and KQED was one. And they did a piece about him visiting in the late 60s and interviewing young people, which he loved to do throughout. So what you see with Baldwin in the Bay Area is um, he went to Castlemont. There are, you can look this up, there are recordings of Baldwin going to Castlemont, and he loved talking to young people. He goes to Cal, and he loves talking to young people. He loves hearing what they have to say, but he also loves challenging them and their belief systems. And I think until he died, you know, in the 80s, I think he always was fond of that and would come back to do it. The ironic thing to me is, in our story, um, so we start... The big, one of the biggest challenges in telling his story was there wasn't much female representation. Baldwin doesn't write a lot about women, but particularly in the early part of his career, like the first half of his career, let's say. Um, but I was like, but he loves women. You, his relationships are deep. So we open with a prologue with Lorraine Hansberry as he is struggling to write his third novel, Another Country, and he gets invited to go to Istanbul, and within months, he finishes the novel. He's been spending years, almost a decade, trying to write this novel. But he gets there, and he writes it. So we open with Lorraine Hansberry, and we close with Nikki Giovanni, the poet, young poet at that point. She was 28, same age he had been when he left America. And he was 48. And uh, this beautiful show out of New York, another one of these public access shows, um, called Soul, and they actually made a documentary yes. about that a few years ago called Mr. Soul. And the guy, Ellis Hazlip, wanted to interview yes. Baldwin, and Baldwin refused to come back to America. So he said, well, what if you went to London? So Baldwin went to London, they flew Nikki Giovanni to London, and she did this interview with him. And it's, it's just gorgeous. So we, we open with Lorraine Asbury, we close with Nikki Giovanni. Wow. And a lot of stuff in the middle. You don't need just like, you must have a few random quotes here and there from Baldwin that could uh, remind us of who this guy is. I, I, I had a pile of quotes that we end with, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't say so we have seven actors. And I wouldn't okay. say who was saying what. I say just pick an just pick a quote, pick a quote. So the one I ended up with is not everything that is faced can be changed, but nothing can be changed until it is faced. Um, and <laughs> the other ones that I had to cut, <laughs> there were some where I do got, now. That's uh, what we're here for. <laughs> Go on. Uh, uh, I'm, there were just um, white folks. You know, him talking about white people. Um, I would have to look at that one. Okay. Um, but um, <laughs> I, so I cut some of those because we have, we have one white man, one white woman, and then we have a young Latino man who actually gets to play a few different characters. And I, the other thing one, I think people three. don't know about Baldwin is that he was a poet. One, two, three. And, yes. um, and so we have a beautiful, Six. what we do in the show is we, Riffing off of the uh, the documentary, I'm Not Your Negro, um, we did I'm Not Your Negro Poet, I'm Not Your oh, Black my. Boy, I'm Not Your Native Son, I'm Not Your um, Negro know. Playwright, I'm Not Your Black Activist. One, um, and we show how this is the way that six. Baldwin throughout his life kept refusing to let people pigeonhole him. Um, so is he a playwright? Yes, there are some plays and we touch on them. But um, he actually found his voice in theater by being a director. He directed, at the time, Fortune and Men's Eyes was a popular play. It had gone to New York, Canadian playwright. Um, and then it went to London. And then the people he was staying with were some of the premier actors in Turkey. And they had a theater company in Istanbul. And they said, why don't we get Jimmy to direct this? So he directs this play that is about gay men in Canada, locked up in a correctional in institution, and um, and they had to translate it, and they couldn't 
find the language for it. So it actually took three people. It took somebody who understood Turkish, um, James, who was able to help them talk about um, what would be the language of the gay culture and the actor who was involved, all of them working together to create this vocabulary of, you know, of, of the jail and of gay culture in Turkey. Um, that was not part of the common vernacular, and it became, because of this play, because of this production, James Baldwin gave Turkey a way to talk about what it is to be gay, what it is to be that, what that culture is. And I was like, wait a minute, this is something nobody knows about. Nobody sees this. So we, we get to play with all of this. And going back to the poetry piece, um, he published a book of poetry right before he died. Uh, it's called Jimmy's Blues. And I flipped through it, and I was really struck with this one poem, and it's where we take our title from, Inventory. And the full title of the poem is Inventory Slash on Being 52. Can you read and it for us? so... Hmm? Would you read it What's for that? us? Would you read oh, it for us? Jeez. That's a long one. I, I, let me see if I can pull it up. Okay, I, I just want, um, I mean, um, he people really, journey, once people he, hear a little oh, bit of his language, they want to know, boy, you know, once you get a little bit of this, you know, yeah, it's like, uh, I can, I can meet, me in a, meet me in the village, next shop, 20 bucks, but go, please. This is um, the beginning of it. My progress report concerning my journey to the Palace of Wisdom is discouraging. I lack certain indispensable aptitudes. Furthermore, it appears that I packed the wrong thing. I thought I packed what was necessary or what little I had, but there is always something one overlooks, something one was not told or did not hear. Furthermore, some time ago, I seem to have made an error in judgment turning this way instead of that, and now I cannot radio my position. I am not sure that my radio is working. No voice has answered me for a long time now. How long? I do not know. And that, we do like eight. We broke it up into eight segments. It becomes sort of the spine of our play. And I was fascinated that this man, in his 50s, is still asking himself, what is it that I need to do in life? Where am I trying to get to? What is it I'm looking for? And so I love that we get to pick all these, I got to pick all these things and sort of hang them off the spine that is this play, including um, in the next verse, he talks about the, uh, the howling man. And it, there's no description of who the howling man is, and I, everything I've tried to read to analyze the play, nobody talks about it. But I'm like, if you're talking Kids. when James Baldwin is coming up, there's only one howling man. There's only one howl. Yeah. And it would be somebody that James Baldwin would have been, I mean, and, you know, Ginsburg. And it got everybody's out. attention. Right. Right. <laughs> Ginsburg is out, and he is speaking as his You can't say that. World. I know. He is changing the world. Yes. Uh, I mean, to the Supreme Court, this is an amazing thing. So I can't help but imagine that a James Baldwin has an aspiring writer wouldn't be like that guy i want to do what that guy is doing yeah. but he says in that poem he says but i cannot hear him so it's it just was a beautiful way he to never heard of ginsburg thing. he never heard ginsburg i'm sure he heard ginsburg no i mean i don't know i couldn't find anything about them meeting oh i see and that's what i or or having a relationship for that matter. But I love that it allowed us to bring in the this beautiful young man who Baldwin can't help but be drawn to on so many levels. And so we get to pull that into it. The same actor plays the um, the Turkish host, Ingen, Ingen Jazar, um, who was an actor that Baldwin met at, in Broadway when he was doing, uh, he did an adaptation of Giovanni's Room. And this young man played Giovanni. And then he went back to Istanbul and invited Baldwin to come, and Baldwin came. So it was kind of neat to see those parallels and neat to see, um, 
he meets this guy. He, he, that same actor plays our Giovanni in Giovanni's room. The same actor plays the young character in uh, Fortune of Men's Eyes that he would have played in Istanbul as that actor. I'm like, these, I mean, the audience doesn't know all of this, but you see the connections because you see the same actor doing it. And those are, those are such beautiful, real connections. I was like, oh, yeah, <laughs> this is what we're doing. This is going to work. Beautiful. Beautiful. You want to share? So we put him on a train. We put him on a train, and we say he's going to Istanbul, and then all these memories start coming out, and then all these experiences happen, and then we have to bring him back. When we did the Richard Wright piece, we did it about the end of his life and the struggles he had, but, you know, getting him to that end point, his death. With Baldwin, his death is, I, I was joking about it last night, but I would love to do a sequel and do a Baldwin musical which I would set in the south of France at Chateau Baldwin, where he was hosting Miles Davis and um, Don Cherry and Nina Simone and Buford Delaney. I just saw pictures today of Buford Delaney, this painter, Beautiful. and writers coming through. And that's what Baldwin did for like the last 16 years of his life, was he just had an ongoing salon. And I'm like... I love that story. It's a beautiful story. But I love even more the story of this artist who even at the pinnacle of his, of his career is still asking himself, how do I find my way to the Palace of Wisdom? Well, listen, it's, uh, some people might want to find their way to the Palace of Wisdom. Um, maybe you have information if people want to know more about what's up. Sure. Um, well, the, um, you can get a little more information about the project, and you can get tickets, of course, at Baldwin Centennial Project.com. All one word, Baldwin Centennial Project.com. I just, I wanted people to, something that they could remember, Baldwin Centennial Project.com. And we're, uh, yeah. this, we're closing this weekend. We're going to be at the BAM House in downtown Oakland. It's Broadway and 15th, which is a, barely a block from both the downtown BART stations. The uh, city center of 12th Street has an exit at 14th Street and you're right up, we're right up the street. If you go to 19th Street, there's an exit at 17th Street and we're barely a block away from there. Um, so it's the BAM house. It used to be called the Flight Deck. For many years, they were doing theater at the Flight Deck. It has been taken over by the Lower Bottom Players and they are trying to create a black arts um, movement, so a black arts district. And so they are, um, bringing theater All to right. this space, and they they are hosting us. So we'll be there Thursday, thank you. Friday, thank Saturday. You, Robin. We are out of time. Um, so thank you. So thank you. Really beautiful work, James Baldwin, here in the Bay Area. Love it. Stay tuned.